Hello, everyone. I come from Western Australia. Actually, <laughs> actually, I was born in Cessnock. You know where that is? Yes. Yeah, okay. I lived in New South Wales for, until I left university. Then I went to Victoria. Well, I didn't stay there that long. <laughs> but I ended up in Western Australia in 1974 by accident because my husband got a job over there and I actually made him stay there because I got a job over there. So I've stayed at the University of Western Australia for whole of my career and I'm still there. But it's been a wonderful place to work on soil. You know, because most people think sand gropers, you know, that sand. But soil, sandy soil is very interesting. So that's where I come from. That's what I know about a bit. So following on Colin, I agree with him definitely about the plant. The plant-soil interactions is what this is all about. So now make sure I press the right button here. So I'm going to talk about plant-soil interactions and soil health. Soil biological fertility, plant diversity, inputs, management, a little bit about thinking of um, soil biodiversity and the Soil Health app. Now that little logo, just I'll put that in the begin beginning. Has anyone heard of the Soil Health app? No? It's free. We made it with a land care grant and you can download it but don't do it now. Um, from either your phones, whatever kind of phone, we had to make two apps. And it's got a lot of information about soil health, soil biology, and you can look at that later on. Now, our research is funded by a lot of people over the years, you know, 49 years is a long time, and we've been supported by many organisations in agriculture and many people have contributed. But I started out being funded by the Australian Wool Corporation. It changed its name. But I started working in pastures and I've really kept that interest in what biological processes are going on in the soil in pastures. So I'm grateful. So anyone got sheep? Anyone got sheep in there? Well, you know, your ancestors probably paid for my early career. <laughs> now, just while we're on this, have you all got soil on your place? Yeah. Got some soil? Yeah. Well, you know more about your soil than anybody, actually. Do you go and look at it every day? Have you got a spade? Do you carry a spade in the truck? So who would dig a hole in their soil now and then? Yeah, well, you know, it's a great thing to do because we can do a lot of fancy analyses on soil and that's good because whatever we want to use that information for, but you having a feel about your soil and, you know, how hard it is and how... Um, dry it is and how wet it is. These, these are a very important part of understanding your system. So I'm going to talk about diversity. We came up on the board, diversity. But we've got diversity of soil. So soils are very diverse. Plants are very diverse. And microbial and animal communities in soil are very diverse. I've got a picture here down the bottom of a sandy soil on the Swan Coastal Plain. Now that's not where most of agriculture is in Western Australia, but Horticulture is often grown in these sands, completely just sand, not much else. The picture at the top is a clay soil from northern New South Wales. I had to go up there to get a picture of clay. But it, we do have some heavier soils. But it's at actually the interaction between soil diversity, plant diversity and all these community, communities, which are not all the same in all the soils, but they have similar functions. So. When you say what is soil health, we discussed, it actually, the definition is a general de definition, but the specifics are related to your place. So it's related to what you do, what you grow, but it's also related to that soil that you're, you're doing these things with. So you can't always compare what you're doing with someone else because your situation is going to be unique to you. So soil's got a little bit of organic material roots and all the organic matter from plants and, and animals and bugs. But it's only a little bit, and we talked about it before, but it is really crucial to make the whole ecosystem work. So it's very crucial what we do with that. Most of it is not living. And most of the organisms in soil at any one time are sleeping. They're active when conditions are right. So plant diversity, when we grow crops in Western Australia, we 
grow wheat and we grow canola. It's just one plant at a time. But I became interested in putting more variety into our pastures and it's very simple, but mostly our, our pastures in Western Australia, in the sheep area anyway, are annual. So in the summer, everything's dried off and we've started to look at introducing perennial grasses into our pastures, which might sound a bit odd to you because it might be more common here, but in Western Australia it's not common, although there are people who are doing this very well, they, there's a lot of understanding and we've been learning from that. So that's putting diversity in the pastures and then looking at the communities under those is what we're interested in. Now, soil is very diverse. We've got fungi associated with roots and mycorrhizas, which I've been working on many years. All the animals that are in there, rhizobia, we put them matched with a legume. And lots of organisms that are involved in the breakdown of organic matter and the cycling of nutrients. And so what happens in science is that you have experts in all of these different areas. So you have someone's expert on the animals, someone on the mycorrhizas. And, but what you have to be is an export, expert on the whole lot because you're managing all of that. So we might think we know a lot about one thing, but someone else knows a little bit about something else. And one might be an expert in plant pathology, someone that's a plant, uh, organisms that kill plants and you've got someone else, organisms, understanding organisms that look after plants. So it's a very complex system. But the scientific community is that complex too. But you, you have to deal with a lot. So you don't need to know all the bits and pieces of it, but that is your situation. You are actually dealing with that complexity. Now, we already got the little comment about physical, chemical, and biological. So when I started doing research, I'd look in the literature to see what people were saying about soil fertility. And for many, many years in my career, soil fertility was about chemistry. Did you have enough nutrients? It was also about physics. I mean, of course, we think about that. But the biological component never fitted in to this. So as long as you had enough nutrients in the soil, your soil was fertile. And so I'm teaching soil biology at UWA for many years with all these people who knew all about nutrients and soils. And I'm thinking, where do I fit? Where does soil biology fit in soil fertility? So, okay, I can study the biology, understand all the organisms, what they're doing. But when it comes to the paddock, are farmers taking note of this information to make decisions? So they're primarily in those days focused on getting the nutrients right. The fertilizers, very well understood. Management of the crops, picking the right crop, very well understood. But how does this biology fit in and how does it actually get into the decision making? So I plotted along and I started using the term soil biological fertility. Now that sounds great because you've got physical fertility, chemical fertility and biological fertility. You think, oh great, we've made some progress here. But then you think, hey, when you start to define these things, you can't separate them. Because biology, biological fertility, interfaces with chemical fertility. So all the nit nutrient cycling that's going on in the soil has a biological component and a chemical component. So, you know, you can, if you study it, you can work out which bits are put on from the fertiliser, which bits are cycled from the organic matter, whatever. And so similarly, if you start to unpick the biology and the physics, they're connected too, because the organisms, when they break down organic matter, produce sticky gums and the hyphae run around in the soil and aggregate soil particles. So the biology is also connected to the physics. So at the end of the day, you can't separate these because, well, you sort of can measure different components of them, but they're all working together. So after many years, I felt like I did fit into the fertility space, but it is more complicated than it seemed to be, and it isn't specifically definable. So you can't just run around and say, oh, I've, got this, I've measured this and it says I've got good biology, or I've measured this and I've got good something else. So, I came to the conclusion at the end of all this that it's better to understand 
these things and then leave it to you to make decisions rather than here's a recipe to get the biology right or here's a recipe to measure the soil and this is what you should measure. So that's how I got to soil biological fertility. But let's look at it. If we are going to focus more on biological fertility, it takes time. So you can't put on, it's not like putting on fertiliser, oh, you get, an, you get a response and therefore you're dealing with biological fertility. So it takes time to develop these processes that help to give nutrient cycling and help to give physical benefits. It can be that if you focus more on the, the, this, that you get you need to have a replacement for it, the, or the biological cycling can be a replacement for inputs. But it's a difference in the time of scheduling of nutrients as well. So if you front end load the fertiliser at the beginning of the season, which is pretty important to get the plants going, but relying on nutrient cycling more means that the supply of nutrients to the plant is different. And then the result of that is that this different rate of availability of nutrients to plants will affect plant physiology and then it could lead to changes in grain, what's in the grain and the development of the grain. And then of course I'm not a farmer and I say at the end of all this that this can be profitable but we've just heard Colin say it can be profitable so I'm more confident putting the profitability thing because I'm not credible in this economic space. But this is the thinking through the process. So it's a different, getting, the, getting more dependence on soil biological fertility has implications for the rates of growth of plants and all of these sorts of things and the production. So just for a minute, I want you to think, what would you feel like if you were inside little, these little particles of soil? There's holes in soil. Maybe you can fit in a little hole water in soil. There's all, this is a very sandy soil, but in a heavier clay soil, these particles, the spaces are smaller and the bacteria and fungi are all in there with the organic matter. And this is where the action is. So in a sand, it's very hard to build soil carbon because the bugs chew it up as soon as they get at it. So one of the things we're trying to do in soil is to protect the organic matter. You don't want to protect all of it because you want it to cycle as well. So you're doing two things at once. You're protecting organic matter to contribute to the soil structure, the nutrient cycling. But you, you're all, well, the soil structure, I guess, mainly. But you also want some of it to break down so you get the nutrient cycling. So this is what's happening. And as soon as you put organic matter into the soil, it's got different structures, that the organisms, there'll be something in there that want to use it to get their own energy and carbon. So protecting organic matter is part of this whole question of building biological fertility. So when you look at so soil and you divide it into the bits, the bit around the roots is called the rhizosphere. So root is rhizo, so rhizosphere. Now in a pasture, you've got roots of different plants all intermingled. So they're next to one another. They've usually got some community structure that's slightly different to another plant. So the plants will have a, a slightly different community of organisms. And, but they'll have fungi, mycorrhizas that are running around intersecting with the different plants. So roots in the soil with the organisms all living in harmony, mostly. And, but they're in, inter, interacting with, the, with each other. So you've, the more plants you've got in there, the more, the, the more you'll build that community structure. But what are the bits and pieces? So you've got a general rhizobial, a general rhiz rhizosphere community, which depends on the plant leaking carbon into the soil. So that's what happens. It's a normal part of the physiology of the plant. Some of the carbon that's fixed and quite a lot of it just leaks straight out into the soil. That then is a carbon source for a lot of organisms in the soil. In addition to the organic matter which is also used at, when it's broken down. So then you have pathogens in the soil and we say the, the pathogens, we want to get rid of them and we spray them or whatever, but the pathogens are normal, a normal part of the community. 
We just don't want them to build up at levels which will come, cause harm. So they're there and they're part of that community. We just want to keep them under control. And there's a lot known with farming practices how to keep these things under control in addition to the options for spraying. So this is keeping the biology in sync, really. That's that ecosystem approach. Then on the right, you're right, the mycorrhizal community. So all, all soils have mycorrhizal fungi. These are, are buscular mycorrhizal fungi in agricultural plants. And nearly all plants form mycorrhizas in agriculture. Do you know a plant that doesn't form mycorrhizas? Right. Yeah. So canola, no. But some plants and wheat commonly has lower levels of mycorrhizas. And so this reason why plants might have different levels of mycorrhizal fungi in their roots is related to our practice. So often we think of adding too much phosphorus fertiliser will decrease mycorrhizas. Have you had heard that story? I'm going to tell you another story. If you add too much nitrogen to, to plants, the roots will grow so fast, the fungi can't keep up. So, you know, we never studied the nitrogen, nitrogen mycorrhiza story in the early days, but nitrogen can influence mycorrhizal fungal colonisation of roots. And it's just physics. How fast can the roots grow? How fast can the fungus grow? Can the fungus keep up? Where's the fungus getting its carbon from? The mycorrhizal fungi. From the roots. They're like electric plugs, so they hook in straight. They don't wait for the carbon to leak into the soil and then be taken up. They plug in like an electric plug, straight into the, carb into the root and get their carbon. So that carbon from the plant is used for root growth, plant growth, and also for fungal growth. So the fungi can only get what it can get, the plant's using it, the fungus, but when it's all in sync, it will work harmoniously. But if you pump the plant up with a lot of nutrients, especially nitrogen, then the roots will grow faster than the fungus can keep up. That's just a little side story because I think it, if you think of how these organisms are living in the soil and how they're growing, you, have to need, you need to know where they're getting their energy from and what's influencing them. And this is really just a physical colonisation story of how the fungus grows in the root and then spreads in the soil associated with that. Then down to rhizobium in the corner. And obviously rhizobium, well developed as an inoculant for agricultural plants in Australia when the native rhizobia were not there. But the remi reminder here is that the inoculants for rhizobia, of rhizobia, that's a gold star inoculant service. You, it's guaranteed the right organism for the soil conditions for the right plant. And contrast that with a lot of the inoculant development now we have does not meet this sort of standard because this, this was developed many years ago and if you're not familiar with the process of getting, you go to the shop and buy your rhizobium, you buy the right one with the right nut label on it for the right plant. But the backstory of that is very, it's a wonderful story in how they've developed the controls for using that material and providing it for our legumes in agriculture. Now this is a poster made by Gupta at CSIRO. Everybody heard of Gupta giving talks to you? No? So, Gupta worked with a person in my group and developed this poster. And I know that you can't see it very clearly, but I can make it available to you if you contact the organisers and we can, we can provide a link to it. But basically it's a story of how roots provide the, or, the, or and plants provide the organic matter to soil and that kick starts the whole cycle of organisms building this community. So you, you start off with the crop residues, the bacteria and fungi colonise it, and then all the other animals come, or all the animals come in cycling process through that. So you end up with the big stuff, but it, all the earthworms are dependent on these other processes that have gone on earlier up the chain. So the little red buckets are the nutrient supply, because all these animals do little poos in the soil, and that's part of the cycling of the nutrients. 
So it's a great poster and we can get it for you if, if you'd like to later on. Now just going on from the animals, I'm not an animal, soil animal expert, but we've had researchers do work on this in the past. This is a number of the, the microarthropods and time along here. And you see, if you sample the soil in summer, nothing's happening, there's nothing. But once you get rain, bang. And in this case, we are adding different types of residues. But the point is that if you sample a soil at a particular time, things might be sleeping. You mightn't have them there. You might think, oh, there's nothing there. If you sample at a different time, they'll be there. So sampling soil biology is complex because it depends on when you do it and what's happening. Now, we've been interested in grazing, and this is grazing with a pair of scissors. In this case, we were studying uh, ryegrass and just looking to see how heavy grazing affected mycorrhizal colonisation of roots. So we were looking at the fungi in the roots in association to grazing. And the picture up the above is about sugars. So, as I said, you get a lot of sugar leaked out into the soil, but these are the sugars that are actually in the roots and available for the fungi. So with no grazing up the top, there's an accumulation of sugar in the roots. And with heavy grazing, there's a lower concentration of sugar in the roots. And so the heavy grazing affects the tops, but it also affects the roots. So when you're grazing plants, different plants respond slightly differently. But grazing the tops is also likely to graze the roots. So you get fewer roots in the soil, so fewer, a lower chance of organic matter accumulating under heavily grazed plants. So the, what's, the roots in the soil are just as important as the tops. So the grazing depends on, or, or the plant growth depends on the carbon, and then that's all happening under, so, under the ground as well. So just looking at the top is one thing, but you've got something else happening in the soil. And this supply of uh, carbohydrate going into the soil is really important for the soil organisms. So these are, these are the perennial grasses in, in that annual system that I was talking about. Now we've done some work in dairy. Uh, any cows around here for dairy? Yeah, yeah. So these, this is on south of Perth. These, this was a trial with the South Southwest Catchments Council, and they had one single hectare plots on three farms with different nutrients applied. So there's a lot of resources that they have that they need to re recycle, and we were looking at that. And this is putting up a graph straight away before explaining it, but I'll take you through it. So we were applying, or they, they had applied manure, compost at two rates, and fertiliser alone. And you notice in this experiment, fertiliser was applied with all of these amendments. So not only did we have the fertiliser alone, but we had these soil amendments with the fertiliser. Because at the time, the farmers weren't game to leave the fertiliser off. And so they left, they put the fertiliser on and the amendments were additional. We wouldn't have designed an experiment like that because we thought, okay, the amendments might be a substitute. But this is the way it was at that time. To, to hold onto a fertiliser, don't let it go because we might not have good production. Now down here, we've got a list here of enzymes. Now you, you've heard of DNA? Have you got any DNA in you? So we can do all these fancy things with DNA these days. So we can take sample from the soil and we can get all the DNA, the pattern of the DNA all measured so you can get this sequencing done. Now that sequencing can tell you, it can match to particular organisms. So you can say, oh, I've got some of this organism, I've got this bacteria, this bacteria. But it can also tell you, you've got a, a pattern which will um, be a blueprint for a particular enzyme or a protein. So instead of saying you're looking at who are the organisms there, you can look at what, what the pattern is for enzymes in that same soil. It's sort of a step towards the function of the soil rather than just who's there. Now in this case, these are enzymes which can cut 
bonds of carbon in um, these molecules. So starch, hemicellulose, cellulose, chitin, lignin. So these are different carbon compounds and different enzymes can be involved in breaking up these. And that's what microbes do. They bust up these bonds. So this is one way of looking at that community in the soil of what potential it has to break up different components of carbon. So that's sort of quite, quite detailed. But we were looking at that to get a little idea of the function of the community of bacteria in these different farms. So three farms with those treatments. I'm not going to worry about what the results were at the time, what we got, but it's more to show you what we can do. Now, when you do this in winter and then you do it in summer, you get a different answer. So there's another layer. Just taking a sample at one point in time tells you what's happening at that one point in time. Taking a sample sometime other means something's happened different. Well, the summer is different to the winter. So we are interested in looking at that change, what's happening over time, but you can't sample it every day. Just too expensive anyway. Now this is a more common way of previously organ looking at the DNA in communities of bacteria. Different soils, and you'll see all different groups of bacteria down here. But all these three soils had the dominant two bacterial communities <coughs> or groups were the same in those soils and then you had a lot of other things. But the trouble is, in each of these little bars, and I'll come to the colour coding in a minute. Are any of you colour blind? It's happening. So the, just you can see how white long the bars are. But within each, each of those bars, there are lots of different organisms and they can do different things. So just measuring these groups doesn't really tell you the function. And in fact, for some groups of bacteria, you only need a little bit to have a big impact. And you mightn't even pick it up in this way. So we can get blueprints of what's going on in soil, but the blueprints are pretty much a lot of detail. We need to then understand a lot more to make this information use useful for you. But in this case, the treatments were biochar added, um, a lime biosolids clay mixture, which the Water Corporation was using at the time in WA, and then a mixture of biochar and that, that lime biochar mix. So, but we can study impacts of soil amendments on communities in this way, and this is an example of what we have done. Now, just quickly, when we treat soil with nitrogen, with fertiliser, with um, soil amendments of any kind, some of those amendments will affect some groups in the soil, but not others. And this is an example. So this is from another study, which is a dairy study. That actinobacteria with two different plants, clover and ryegrass, adding nitrogen at different levels. So we were following this one group of bacteria at one time. And you see, if you follow this big patch here, that's the dominant organism in, or the group in the soil. It was very little affected by adding the nitrogen or having a different plant. So it just more or less stayed the same at the time we sampled it. But this group, Cytobacteria, and if you take the bluey coloured the, where the star is, you follow that through, it was, it, that group did change with these treatments. So if you're going to go to the detail of DNA analysis of soil, if you just look at the big picture, it doesn't actually tell you the, the important picture. It tells you that things are affected or not affected, but we need to understand the function and what's the implication of these changes, and that can be investigated. But it's not so useful at your level of you. You're trying to decide what you're going to do in the paddock, and this is a level of understanding. You need, we need to translate this understanding into something that then is useful to you. Now, I told you I worked on mycorrhizas, and I'm not going to talk much about mycorrhizas, but if you look at roots under a microscope, you can't see there's any fungi in those. I mean, I've made this so you can actually see the hyphae associated with the roots, but these roots that I've got here 
are full of fungi if you stain them. So your roots, apart from canola or whatever, they're full of these fungi. Now, to me, that's interesting. To you, you might say, well, what are they doing? And they're doing a lot of things that we can't measure entirely, quantify in the soil. And in these studies that I'm going to talk about now, these are the three dominant fungi in, in these roots. And they're all colonising the same roots. So there's no specificity like rhizobium. And then we did treatments in this case. We added mineral fertiliser, we added a microbial inoculant, we had a control with nothing, and then we had a chemical fertiliser. So we were looking at how these soil amendments affected these communities of fungi. So the background to this is we think, oh, these fungi are different, and therefore they'll function differently. And that is not easy to demonstrate in the field. We can do it in pots. But we were interested in that, that story. Did the soil amendments affect who went into the roots? So again, we've got colour coding to those treatments. So a mineral fertiliser, microbial inoculant and a chemical fertiliser. And we followed, using a DNA technique again, the presence of these groups of fungi in those roots. And they all went in, all the, both the plants, but the relative abundance of those fungi in the different roots was not the same. So if you get a soil test and you say it's got 10%, 50% mycorrhizas, well, there's a substory to that, which fungi are there? And the substory to that is what are those fungi capable of doing? So my take on this is that most of these fungi do have a big important contribution in the soil with the hyphae they make for soil aggregation. But demonstrating the fine tuning of their benefit is very difficult. So I've still worked on these things for 40 years, 49 years actually. I still have faith in them having an important role in the soil, but individually they can do little things, but collectively at the level of the paddock is much harder to demonstrate. But the bottom line would be we need to keep them in there and they can, we can use them to say whether what's going on in your soil, if you're knocking these guys out, there's probably a problem. So that's sort of the, one of the better benefits that we can have. That's just saying the same thing. So just to finish, I've worked a lot with farmers in Western Australia to try and do soil tests. What do you measure? How do you do it? And in this case, it's how, what can you, you do yourself? So with the Wheat Belt NRM, we developed a little handbook and this is available on their website so we can send you a link of this. It's a bit of a background to some of what I've been talking about, but it's what you can do at home. And it includes assessing mycorrhizas in your roots if you want to. So we've given a little story of how to do that. That's in the book. So we can download that. And then I'll just make go back to the where I started about the Soil Health app. And that's just got a lot of information about soil biology which it, you can download, once it's downloaded on your phone or your iPad or whatever, you, can, you don't have to connect back to the internet. But there are podcasts on that which we can change. So if you've got an idea you want to do, a, have a podcast about soil health on our Soil Health app, we can arrange that because the podcast can be taken. It, currently, they're all just me rabbiting on, but we can take them off and we can put more interesting people on there. So that's the flexible part of the app. But the, there's videos and the, the animated videos and um, just information for you to watch where you've got nothing else to do. So hopefully uh, this has given you a little window in what I'm about. Anyway, happy to talk to you later in the day. Thank you. Thank you.